Hey folks, it's Andrew, and before we get started with our new video, I want to take a quick moment to give a shout out to Eric Barlato and his amazing organization, RIC Cyber. They are having a virtual conference on December 4th with the goal of creating diversity within the cybersecurity community. There are some amazing guests that are coming to the conference to speak on our behalf, and we would love to have you attend. We are also honored to have the keynote speaker of Congressman Lou Carrera. I will link below in the description the registration and it is free for you to register and come on board and we would love to have you join us and hear about some great topics. See you soon. Hey everybody, it's Andrew here at All Things I Am. So we just wrapped up our series on authentication and we talked about the basics about authentication. Now let's talk about authorization and what does that really mean? And in this video, I'm gonna take a little bit of a different approach. So obviously before you noticed that in my other videos, it's just me and you. But in this video, I'm actually gonna go to more of a PowerPoint presentation and kind of walk through everything about authorization. I really feel that this will give you a better idea about what's going on, the different models, and it's just easier for me to explain it there because again, as always, pictures, they just speak better than me just talking all day long. So let's go ahead and just get started with the presentation. So let's talk about authorization. What is authorization? So authorization is what a user can do after a successful authentication. If you go to Google and you look up other definitions, you might find some such as, it's the process of giving someone access to a resource, which is nice. And that's really, really what it is, right? Is I'm going to give somebody permissions or authority to do something that they should be able to do. So there are a couple of types of authorization out there. The first one is rules. So we have rules, another is policies, and then the last one we're gonna talk about is access models. So let's get a little bit deeper about each one of those three. So rules. So what are rules? Think of rules as an explicit set of regulations that a user must meet to get access. In other words, you can write rules such as giving your corporate employees access to their corporate intranet if their IP address meets the corporate environment. That's a rule, you have to meet this rule. Another common one that is used today is only during the work week, so let's say Monday through Friday if you're in America, that you can only access a certain amount of applications. And then in the weekends, those applications are not available to you. You have to wait. These are particular rules that, again, a user has to meet to get access to something. So the next one are policies. And they are similar to rules. The only difference is, is you have a set of permissions that are assigned to a role or user based on something. So these are common on cloud deployments like AWS, right? And again, what policies want you to do is it's especially used to allow or deny access or authorization to people based on criteria. Some common examples are if you're gonna get access to something based on parts of your identity, right? Some attributes, for example, or maybe a certain application, right? So if I have a policy that, you know, only end users can access application and we get these set of permissions, right, based on that. These are policies. And there are some like session policies that I already talked about a lot, right, but we really want to limit the amount of time somebody has access to something. So if I log into, let's say, like a Salesforce application, right, and I'm in there doing my work, I get called away for like a meeting, and I go away, I leave my desk. And this is more pre-COVID, but today, if I'm in an office and I leave, and I'm still logged into the system, and, and I'm not doing anything, I should be logged out, right? Or I require re-authentication. So that's like a session policy that you can put in place there. And the common one that people really talk about when it comes to policies is segregation of duties. Think of segregation of duties are policies to help you limit your risk or to not allow fraud. Common ones you hear a lot are bank situations. So, or for, in my example, you can have somebody who can approve and pay a purchase order. And then you have somebody who can create a purchase order, right? So if you have a same person that with both, both of those permissions, that's a violation, right? Because again, how can you stop somebody from creating a purchase order, making like a dummy, dummy account or a dummy company and then paying themselves, right? So we again want to limit fraud. So when that situation would occur, what you would really want to do is 
if I'm requesting access right now to be a purchase order approver or a person who payer, but I already have the role today or the permission to create a policy, I'm sorry, excuse me, to create a purchase order, then that will be a violation or it won't allow me to do that. And then I violate that policy. So that's something where I'll be denied. So that's a good example or a couple of good examples of what policies are. So now let's talk about access models. And there are a fair amount of access models out today. One of the access models that are common is RBAC or role-based access control. Another one you might hear is ABAC or actually based access control. The third one we have is PBAC or policy-based asset control. And this is something that's fairly new and I'm doing more research to provide, you know, better detail for you guys who are listening to these videos or watching these videos, excuse me. And I, it's, it's catching a lot of traction, you know, in our IEM space. So I'm actually really excited to kind of learn more about this um, and then see how these are implemented today. Cause to be very fair, I have not implemented any kind of feedback in terms of in my career for customers, but I'm very excited to learn this to see if it's something that I can do in future videos or not even videos for my customers itself and see how that works. ACLs or access control list is something that is common. It's all these older systems. When I first got into cybersecurity, one of the first systems that I really worked on and in terms of you know doing security had ACLs and it had a fair amount. I'll talk more about ACLs in another video, but it is still out there and it is cumbersome and it can be a lot of problems, but we do have it in there. Finally, the, the last two I wanna talk about are more data related, right? Or restricting of data. You see this more common in government entities. So the first one is MAC or mandatory access control. And then the last one is discretionary access control or DAC or DAC, right? These are more for making sure that when you have sensitive data or information, it's not leaked to people who are not authorized to see it, right? So uh, let me give you a great example. And again, I have a video, I'm gonna have videos for these to talk about ETV specifically, but in terms of like DAC or MAC, right? Is if I'm a civilian and, I and I'm going to log into a system that maybe has some toxic, top secret information on there, if I don't meet or I'm, if I'm not quote unquote cleared as a individual, I should be able to see that data at all, right? And I will go more into depth about those, but that's kind of how, how Mac and DAX are used today, especially in the government entity, uh, to make sure that our top secret information isn't leaked to public or, you know, state nations that can do harm to us. So in this video, now that we have understood a little bit about authorization, I'm gonna dig into more about RBAC or role-based access control because it's common. And it's one of the most common ones that you'll see out there. So even you, all those who are watching this video who are interested into moving to cybersecurity, you'll see a lot of job descriptions saying, hey, can you talk about RBAC or have you ever implemented that, right? And my goal in this video is to help teach you the core concepts of RBAC, the different models, and then how can you can implement it in your system today. So there are a couple types of RBAC out there. And NIST did a paper, I wanna say about 10 to 15 years ago, and I'll link it in the description, that they came up with four models in terms of RBAC that's being used today. And one of them is a flat model, another is a hier hierarchical model, constraint is the third model, and then the fourth model is symmetrical. So let's, let's look at those a little bit more further, right? So let's say you have an individual here, right? And they come in and they want access to applications, right? So here we have somebody who wants permission to Office 365. They want access to their timekeeping software, some end user application, and then they want access to VPN, right? And these are common things. Again, we call these entitlements right here. And we want to, let's say, bundle them over into a role, right? So in this model, what we'll do is we'll bundle these all together into a single role, and then we will assign that role to a user. And that is commonly what we call a flat model. Some of the things about a flat model that I want you to be aware of is you can have role assignments from many, many users to many, many role assignments. And that gets massive at times, so just think about that. And then also, you can have many permissions to, to multiple roles at a single time. What does that mean? So if you look at the, the, the model here today, you can have Office 365, not only in this one role, but maybe in two or three or four other roles, right? And that can be cumbersome at times when you forget or it gets very complex and you have to really figure it out. So that's the flat model where it's common, again, how it is today, but that's one model. 
The second model I want to talk about is Harkel. So let's look at the situation here. I have a senior IM developer here, right? And they have the same thing, TC5 access, VPN, time human software. But you notice here on the bottom, bottom right -hand corner here, you have an IM software and I have admin rights to that one. Now the person on the far right, they're a junior security IM developer. And here, same thing as the security IM developer, but they only have end user access to it. So what makes this hierarchical is what if I have a senior IM manager, right? Let's say this is a individual who will manage both the IM developer and the IM's junior developer, right? And she comes in and she says, you know what? I want to, I'm, I'm your manager. I'm going to access to everything. What, what happens? So rather than me requesting a role, I will request one role and I will inherit everything up, right? Which is hierarchical. Since I am on the top of the food chain, I'm going to get everything that the I am developer has and also everything that the junior, junior developer has and that's a hierarchical model. Also just be aware that the hierarchical model, you inherit everything that the flat model offers too. So think of it as hierarchical will take everything the flat model has to offer and hierarchical again. So uh, inherit everything that people below me have today. Now let's, now let's let's look at the third model, right? So again, I talked about everything in terms of same access, hierarchical, bring up, right? So the big difference I wanna, for you to really look into is this security IAM developer here, they have a developer access in IAM, right? So whatever the software that you're using, this person is developer, so they have developer access. Now, I have a tester here who their job is to test the application. So their access might be totally different. So, and then I have the IM manager here who wants both, right? But let's go back. So remember when I talked about policies, right? And segregation of duties. So in this scenario here, what I talked about earlier of a hierarchical, this person wants to do it, but if you think about it, and just take a second to think about it. So I have a developer, right? They probably have admin rights to the code. They can manipulate the code themselves, right? But I have a tester who maybe their job isn't really to manipulate the code or they can modify things to make a test work. And they might have limited access. Now you're now you're telling me that you have an IAM security manager who wants both, right? And you're thinking, wait a minute, I just talked about hierarchical where I want to inherit that, right? But getting these two permissions could be potentially fraud. Again, think about it. So I want to inherit these two permissions to say, hey, you know what? I'm your manager, I should have that, right? Well, you shouldn't because again, you are letting me manipulate the data. What if as a security IAM manager, I get developer access to, let's say put a back door into this system. But as a tester, I can go in and I, I can test it, right? Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, shouldn't developer, developer access have basically, you know, all the rights? You could which is true, but as a tester for testing access, you might only have limited access, but then you can validate things. Or maybe you have access to like a database, right? To look at the data to test it. But a developer, you might not have access to a database. And again, you are given all the rights to do basically everything that, you're, that you shouldn't do. Because again, if you're a person who is working on the system, so think, think about it, if you're an end user, you don't have access to a lot of things. But now as a security IM manager, you want to have both. And that is a, problem and that's a violation of segregation of duties so in this model it's called a constraint model because really you have everything from a hierarchical standpoint everything from the flat standpoint but you're trying to inherit two permissions that conflict with each other because you give me too much too much rights and that is a violation or as my little friend here says should be the case and that is a constraint model because again, you are given everything from a, from a role perspective in terms of getting access from our back model, but you always got to take into account anything that is a violation or segregation of duties right there. And that's why it's constrained because sometimes when this happens, you have to have your policies in play to say, no, 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 this cannot work. So you cannot inherit both of these, which is different that if you didn't do that, then that becomes a hierarchical model. And then you risk, you, you have that risk that a person can have a lot of access where they shouldn't have access. And then the last one I want to talk about is the same concept, right? So I have a, I have a person here, same information, they have roles, right? And they have it to an individual. Now I have a manager here. So at the bottom of the screen here, you have a manager. And let's say mm, every year, right, they need to do an annual review. And, and I am, we call it certification, right? Some people call it as station. And 
what the point of, of it is to say, you know what, I'm going to validate that this person, let's just call him John, John works for me, Here are all his, here's all his access, I'm going to validate that this access he has today should still be there. What if John was to move departments or change positions? Here, let's make it easier. Change positions, same department, but change positions. And in that position change, his access to his older work is no longer needed. In this model here, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna certify that John should still have those permissions or roles or entitlements today, or they shouldn't. And in that model, we call it symmetrical because really what it does is same thing, I am inheriting everything from the flat model to the hierarchical model to the um, constrained model. But then the last one from the symmetrical is I am doing validations yearly, quarterly, where I have people, managers, or, or maybe even SOX people within your organization who will go in and validate that these role assignments should still be valid. And if they shouldn't, they will then say deny or reject. And what can occur, depending on the organization that you work for, is they can remove that from the system itself or from the user to keep what we call least privileged model, right? Which allows them to do their job and that's it and nothing more. So those are the four models when it comes to RBAC, right? And you're thinking, okay, you know, this makes sense. We can do this, which is fine. I want to talk a little bit more before we leave about pitfalls, right? What happens? And I allude to this a little bit in my, in my talk, but here's two pitfalls when it comes to implementing RBAC. You have something called role explosion. What is that? When I talk about the flat model, right, about permissions to roles, many to many, right? There are times where you have situations where you want to say, you know what, let's just create a role for that, right? Because you have, let's say, a new job title that comes into play, or you have these people who say, you know, I really need this all the time, and it may be particular. Rather than just, just assigning them at a one-off and then maybe moving afterwards, you say, let's just create a role. And what it becomes is role explosion. You're creating roles after role after role after role, and it gets too complex. A lot of organizations that I've worked for to help them get to the RBAC model, they were using spreadsheets to really track that. And now you're using a RBAC model to do roles, but then you're creating roles after roles after roles. You're not making any progress. You're just making it harder, right? So one of the things that I really stress when you look at RBAC is when you take into consideration, you know, what processes, what authorization they really need to keep it simple, right? Because if you don't, then role explosion is gonna happen where you can have places where you have over a million roles. And to be honest with you, I've worked on two projects in the past where I've had to do some role mining where I found almost 700,000 roles writing a script and it was not pretty. And our goal was how do we condense this? And that's one thing that RBAC does, doesn't do well is the fact that it, it, it's, a, it's, it's more, um, it's coarse grain as they call it, and you can have that where you get too lost in the shuffle and you start to recreate role after role after role. So again, be careful when you do RBAC and not go into that all model of just creating a role just for a sake of creating a role. The second thing I wanna talk about is roles that only limit software and, and area only. So I talked earlier about, you know, um, DAC and Mac, right? Where, you know, a lot of times it's about data. RBAC doesn't do that. So what RBAC does is RBAC limits access to a application, right? Or something you can or can't do from there, but doesn't limit data. So if I take my good example of my top secret you know, example, right? So I have access using RBAC to a system. So I come in. I'm a, let's say, senior, senior, senior um, DB admin. I get, I get a role assigned to me saying I'm DB admin. The problem though that maybe companies don't realize is I come in that that database that I have access to might have sensitive information. Let's say social security in there. You shouldn't, but some people do. But let's just say you have, have social security in there, right? Um, I can't limit that. If I'm somebody who's maybe a different department, but then I have access to the entire organization database, I can see other people's social security numbers, maybe even their salary, right? But maybe that's only for HR. You can't limit that. 
You can't just say, you know what, you can only have HR database data. Unless you have a separate database for, for the HR team and a separate database for, let's say, IT, which is, I mean, it can happen, but I, I, I haven't seen a lot of it. It's, 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 it's not like it's, it's common in terms of having a single massive database that has different, uh, different views, right, or different columns to kind of house all that. So I can't just limit that from that little specific within the system. And that's the limitation of, of RBAC is I can access or I, excuse me, I can limit the, ac the, the access to your system or to your application, but I can't, I, I can't limit the data within that. So that's another pitfall that to be very clear or to just be, to be, to just think about it, right, is RBAC is great. It's nice to have an automated process, but then you have to think a step further and be like, whenever I give access to something in the system, can everybody see it that gets assigned to a role or are only particular people allowed to see it? And if that's the case, RBAC might not be the best model for you. So one to just talk about pitfalls, but you know, a lot of times RBAC is good. To be very honest, you know, RBAC I think works well for more middle to smaller organizations. When you get to a massive, massive organization, I think combinations of RBAC and ABAC might be in play. And that's something I'll talk about in the next video is talk about ABAC and how that works out to be. So I hope that was helpful for you in terms of learning what RBAC is. And now for those who are transitioning into IM who want to get into the field, RBAC is common, right? In terms of what hiring managers are looking for. Do you know what it is? And I can think right now, you're thinking to yourself, how do I prove I know this because I don't have the work experience? Here's my challenge to you, or here's how you should handle this. Take your job today. Think about when you first started. How was your first couple of days? Were you sitting at your desk doing nothing? Maybe reading user guides to get up to speed? Maybe, did you have a laptop? Did you have like a phone or anything like that? Or were you waiting? Now, if that's the case, and the answer is yes to that, think of how RBAC would fix that, right? Would you be able to say, okay, I'm gonna go and talk to my organization to say, how do we bundle this roles to people and give it to them day one, right? Are, are there all employee roles that we can give to people, to give them access to, let's say, a computer, office, email, a phone maybe, and at least that's a start, right? Or their internet, right? That's how you would tell hiring managers that when you interview, take your current job and think about how can I implement RBAC today and make my job easier and people who come be come after me better too. The better you can explain that model and how maybe the different types of the, the flat, the hierarchical, the constrained, and even the symmetrical model, how you would use those models for RBAC, it's a good start, right? And you put in the hiring manager's you know, head, oh, you know, okay, this person understands you know, the concepts of RBAC, and that's, and that's the whole point of my videos, right? I wanna give you some things that you can build upon and then think about how can I apply this to my job today? So, with that being said, I really am excited that you took the time to really listen to this video and you learn more about RBAC. In our next video, we're gonna talk more about ABAC or attribute based access control and how that model is used today, how different it is from RBAC. So again, one more time, I'm gonna plug Eric and go to Hiaces and I will put the link down below. Great conference on December 4th, join, it's free. Great speakers. I'm actually part of that organization and I love what Eric's doing. I am so happy to help out in any way and I really hope you watching would join that and watch that. And as always, stay curious because you never know. I'll see you soon. Have a good one.